we get to start off the new year with a new sermon series, and uh, we're going to spend the bulk of the year in uh, in two books of the Bible. We'll spend the bulk of the year in uh, pr- probably this first first quarter, first uh, eight to ten weeks in the book of Malachi, and really excited about this. Um, and then uh, that will take us pretty close to Easter, uh, if not right up until Easter. I'm getting the sense, the more I prepare, that it's going to take us up to Easter. And maybe it'll be a little elasticity there, and it'll take us a little beyond it. We'll have to see. But And then we'll spend uh, really the rest of the year, aside from a few breaks here and there, uh, in the book of Ephesians, which is rich. Uh, for us. And so we'll go slowly through the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is applicable to each and every one of us in many, many, many different ways. So wherever you're at in your walk with the Lord. And and similar, uh, Malachi. Wherever you are in your walk with the Lord, the the, the book of Malachi, the the, the Lord has a word for us from Malachi. And so uh, I hope you're excited to dive into it. Now, I I will say, Malachi, uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. It's the last book in the Old Testament. So find Matthew and go back one or two pages. Well, one page will get you to Malachi. Two or three pages will get you to chapter one of Malachi. Four chapters in Malachi. It's not a long book. It's only 55 verses. And I think like 49 of them are spoken by God, which makes sense because it's a prophet. It's a prophecy book, right? And what, what is prophecy? Well, prophecy is God declaring a message directly through a man for mankind, for a particular people in a specific situation. And so um, sometimes, I see, I can feel myself already getting ahead of, self, my, uh, get, getting ahead of, ahead of myself, but sometimes we, uh, we think about the Old Testament and we think, uh, well, that was for them and the New Testament is, is for me, or that was for then and the New Testament is for now, right? Uh, and We'll talk about this over the course of this entire time. We'll keep revisiting this theme, and I'll elaborate it on it here in a few more minutes. But but um, if you you know if you um, don't have a Bible with you, there's a Bible in a seat back probably near you that you can go ahead and grab, or just open your phone, and um, you may have a Bible app on there too. So uh, I, I, it's always good. I always encourage us. We put uh, you know scriptures on the screen. Um, it's really to he- as a help um, to help you track. I don't want that ever to become. Um, uh, an aversion to using your own Bible, right? So if you have it, open it open it up there. But when God spoke through Malachi to Judah, to the people of Israel, Judah was a tribe of the Israelites. And so you'll hear me use the term Judah or Judites or Israel very interchangeably in this series, because that's the, the subgroup of our particular audience. But uh, Israel, Judah was very confused with what was going on in their life. They had crazy circumstances. Now, when I say crazy, uh, I don't mean God's crazy, but as you and I look at our life, we, we go through situations that, according to our humanity, seem crazy. Uh, it seems uh, like it's something that we can't endure, something that we can't make it through, and that happened in Israel's history all the time. You remember God saved, uh, God, God uh, sent Moses to, to bring the Israelites out of Egypt, right? That's the book of Exodus tells us about that and, and, and Deuteronomy. And so what happens? Well, they get, out of, they get out of Egypt. And I'm telling you, they lived in slavery when they were in Egypt for 40 years, right? And, uh, and um, as soon as they get out of um, their slavery, they find that they're getting kind of hungry. And so they're like, oh, Lord, did you just bring us out in the desert to kill us? Send us back to slavery so we can have good dinner. I mean, that's how we are as a people, right? We're not, we're, we're not going to approach this series in Malachi like, oh, all of the things that we've learned from the Old Testament. Now, we've got this, church family. Let's, let's knock it out of the park. Uh, every generation must go through seasons and periods where they, uh, they are they are tested in the trials of life. God is the refiner's fire, and he is, or or he is putting us through the test so that the faith that God has given us would rise to the top, or really that the dross would rise to the top and the faith would remain as that which makes us solid and secure and strong. And that faith, the Bible tells us over and over and over, is a gift from God's gracious hand. 
Um, so a, a hundred years or so before Malachi was written, the nation of Israel was uh, lived in captivity for several generations. And so when you kind of thumb through your Old Testament, right? You read through 2 Kings and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Lamentations. These describe what's known to our kind of some biblical history as the Babylonian captivity, right? So, um, uh, and even as you read some other prophets, right? Um, The prophet of, uh, oh man, I'm drawing a blank, Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk writes to the people and says, uh, I'm going to judge you with this ungodly nation. They're going to come in and wipe you out. Some of you will remain because I'm faithful to my promise, and so I'm going to always keep a remnant, but I'm going to judge you with this nation that's unfaithful, that's ungodly, right? And Habakkuk's sort of like, Lord, why would you judge us with them? I mean, is the, you know, the conversation is like, Lord, why don't you judge us according to how we think you ought to judge us as opposed to how you think what's right for how to judge us? Does that, does that make sense a little bit? Uh, and so what happens is, as part of this process, right, the Babylonians, they come in and they just wreak havoc in Jerusalem in, with, the, with the Israelites. And so they come in and, and um, you know, you, you've heard of words like um, maybe the, the dispersion, um, the exile, and this would be when they came in and they just basically say, hey, we're taking over, and they basically deport uh, almost all of Israel. Some people were left there to kind of do some menial work and maintain the ground and uh, do things like that and sort of, you know, take care of the ground and keep it, keep it um, a- a- as good ground and whatnot. But, but it, was, it was essentially indentured servitude. It was slave labor. And that's what they did with the nation of Israel. And so uh, when the nation of Israel is living in Babylon, they're miserable. I mean, it's like going all the way back to Egypt in a different sense, right? Living through it again. And they begin to forget that God loves them. Have you ever been in a situation where you begin to forget that God loves you? Yeah, I have too. I'm going to ask you to think about a time when you can remember the last time that you began to forget that God loves you. Can you identify that time? Give me a good strong nod so I can kind of get a read on us. Yeah, I'm nodding to tell you what to do, but I'm also nodding because I can. You see, what happens is our memories for the way that God has demonstrated his love for us are quite short. And our tendency toward beginning to doubt God's love is quite strong and has quite a short fuse. It doesn't take much of this doubting for us to begin to shift into, to begin to shift into uh, really questioning whether God even loves us, right? And so uh, the Lord challenges um, the nation of Israel here with this theme. So the Judite capital, including the temple in Jerusalem, was destroyed, right? You hear as you thumb through the Old Testament, you hear about uh, the Lord speaks that that, that day is going to come, and that day came. The temple's destroyed. They're deported into Babylon, and uh, and they were there for several generations. And while they were there, it was terrible. In fact, Psalm 137 gives us a depiction of this. Now, uh, one of the beautiful things about our relationship with the Lord is we don't, you need, we need to hear this, we don't need to fake it with God. Last year, we spent some time in the Psalms, and in our time in the Psalms, we looked at Psalms of lament, and, and we said it really is good and right and appropriate when we are lamenting, when we are grieving the trials of life, to call out to the Lord, to cry out the Lord. That's worship, actually, to go to our Creator with our lament. Because life isn't always happy. Life isn't always fun. But for those who are in Christ, we have joy through trials. So listen to Psalm 137, and I'm going to put it up on the screen, but I'm going to read it a little slowly because I want us to really to soak this in. By the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. In other words, before we got booted out of our hometown where we worshiped the Lord, now in Babylon, we weep. 
On the willows there we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, and how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. Go to God in your grief. Go to God with your pain, with your confusion. Just a quick summary of one, Psalm 137. They're, they're weeping because they're away from their homeland. They're weeping not just because of the land, but because that is where they worship the Lord. That is where they found kinship and fellowship with the Lord their God. When they remember Zion, they remember the place of worship. They remember the Lord. And they're saying, our tempters, the ones who are holding us captivity. I have to drink there, so I'm just going to hold it the whole service. The ones who are, 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 have us as captives, I mean, they're just mocking us. They're mocking us. Hey, guys, sing to us one of your songs of Zion. We know you're miserable. We're glad about it. We're glad about it because even when they came after us, they said, lay it bare, lay it bare down to the foundations, destroy the whole city. And God's people are saying, Lord, how, how are we supposed to sing your song? I can't worship another God. How are we supposed to worship in this, this captivity? If I'm supposed to sing a song like this, let me just find a willow tree and hang up my guitar. Let me hang up my lyre. If I'm supposed to worship in this foreign land, Lord, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue be stuck to the roof of my mouth. I can't do it. I'm miserable. I'm depressed. I'm despairing. And this was God's people. Maybe about 75 years before Malachi was written. Now, I have to say... There's a little bit of variance on exactly when Malachi would have been written, but so I'm talking in generalities, but it would have been in this general century, in this general time period. Do you hear their pain? The agony? And, and what they're saying at the end, you're like, oh, how could somebody say this? Oh, daughter of Babylon, the children of those who are oppressing us, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against a rock. Now, we've learned from the book of Job that everything in the Bible is true. Everything in the Bible is right and authoritative. But it doesn't mean as a record of history, not everything in the Bible is an example of godly living. And so we acknowledge that this is what the Israelites are feeling at this time. And yet we would affirm with Scripture, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. And so it was a wrong and it was a sinful thought of theirs to say, we're going to repay your descendants for the way that you've treated us. We wish that they would even be dashed against the rocks. Nobody would leave here today and say, yeah, I think that's good advice for the upcoming week. But it is a real, aren't you so thankful that God gives us a real picture 
of real people enduring real difficulty. It's recorded in perfect scripture for us. It was a terrible time, and this time wouldn't be forever. So the end of the exile come, right? So King Cyrus, uh, King Cyrus comes in, and uh, he decrees, and we read about this in Ezra. Uh, I'm not going to read it for us today, but in the beginning of Ezra, the book opens with King Cyrus's uh, beginning of his reign, and he says, return all of the captives back to their homelands, right? So he's saying, get all of the captives back to their home lines. That's the Judites specifically and, and other people that they would have conquered and, and brought into their indentured servitude. And so after that exile, the, the, the Israelites are sent back to their homes. And then we read Ezra and Nehemiah in the Bible. We see the rebuilding of the temple. So this is sort of where we are in our biblical history. It makes sense because that's the last book of the Old Testament. And uh, as I said in sort of a teaser video this week, in the book of Malachi, you sort of get this sense it, 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 as if you're standing in, in a backyard and you're sort of looking over the fence and you can smell it's like if there's two people grilling in the backyard or smoking something in the backyard and the, and the wind just kind of swirls around and you get the sense of both meals you can sort of smell what now you can sort of uh, sm sense the sense um i should have picked a different phrase than sense the sense but you can smell the sense of what god's cooking in the old testament in the old covenant and in the new covenant you get the sense of what's been happening for a couple thousand years, and you also get the sense of where the Lord is going, because Malachi tells us that the Lord is taking us into a new covenant. He says a new prophet is going to come, and he's speaking of, of John the Baptist that will be coming. And so we don't know exactly what it is that caused this particular people group to be forgetting the Lord's love or doubting the Lord's love, but it's not too far of a stretch to think that the generation before this current generation that is Malachi's audience was bitter, grieving, and pained from the years that the Lord had allowed them to walk through. This would be their fault. This would not be God's fault. When one parent or one set of parents goes through difficulty, it can color how they view the Lord, the way they talk about the Lord. Right? We know how it works. You just go through a political season and you hear kindergartners talking about who they're going to vote for or something like that, right? Kindergartners have believe this political theory or that political theory or whatever's happening. Why? Because they hear their parents talking about it. And so the sins of a generation can go for many generations because why? Well, we just pass it down. Like we teach our children how to worship the Lord. We can't make them worship the Lord, but we just begin to pass it down. So uh, a word about reading the Old Testament. Some people take the Old Testament, like I said, uh, well, that was then... And this is now. And we cannot approach the Old Testament that way. Uh, we we, we want to read the Old Testament in its original setting. And we want to recognize it's a particular genre. When I say genre, I just mean a type of literature. If I write a love letter to Sherilyn and somebody finds it on the ground and picks it up, they're going to know exactly what that is. I'm going to use language in it that's intended for that one woman right there that I love. But if I gave that same letter to somebody else, or if it didn't have a name on it and just said Matt at the bottom, context will tell you, you know, Matt McGee. I would, wouldn't sign my name, but my last name. But they would go, oh, this is Sherilyn's letter. It better be Sherilyn's letter. <laughs> you see what I mean? That's how context works. There's a lot that you already know about genre. We don't walk around talking about it all the time, but you already know it, Right? If I were to say that the, that the ducks were swept up in the cyclone, you would not walk around looking for a bunch of feathers today. You wouldn't be going to the weather channel trying to find out what cyclone or what cyclones. Anybody tracking with me yet? There we go. There we go. What cyclones swept through Iowa and took up a bunch of ducks? No, if you have, you know, any concept of what happens in, in national collegiate football, you know it's bowl season. It's playoff season in the NFL, and you know that the, the, uh, that the Cyclones played a fantastic game. Yeah, I know we're in the wrong part for you to be all super happy about this, but some of you are, Bill. Thanks for glad you represented today. But context tells you that that headline is referring to the Fiesta Bowl, Right? and that Iowa State played a great game yesterday and decisively won. This is context. When we read the Psalms, 
Like I just read, we know we're reading poetry that helps us uh, interpret it. We know it's not a literal thing that we're supposed to do, go dashing children against the rocks. Okay, now, all of this is necessary as we read and as we dive into the book of Malachi. And I've already taken one of my buffer weeks, I'm just telling you, because I know you're thinking right now, oh man, we're going to be here for an hour and a half today. I'm not going to do that to you. Today, you're welcome. <laughs> this background is all incredibly important as we begin to look into what God is saying in Malachi, because Malachi is applicable for you and for me today. So 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And I want you to listen to one of the most beautiful verses, but it, it says a lot without saying a lot. It's like the sermon, I wish I could have heard from Jesus but it's not in the Bible. Well, it is in the Bible, just not this way. You'll see what I mean. And Luke, Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them all of the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He said, guys, let me talk to you about what you know about in your Bible, which is our Old Testament. Let me talk to you about what you know in your Bible. And let me tell you how it all points to me. Jesus is reaching back in the Old Testament and he's saying, let me tell you how this points to me. Let me tell you how this points to me. And we don't have a record of that entire con of that conversation, but we know that he walked with his disciples and he explained to them all the things concerning himself. Could you imagine being on that walk? So as we read Old Testament books in particular, but all of the Bible, what we're looking for is this. I want you to catch this phrase. You ready? Enduring truths. When we read about a letter or a prophecy written or spoken to a particular people group in a particular day and time, what, in a particular culture, not everything in that book or that letter or that prophecy is directly written to Dan Shantz or Matt McGee. But all throughout God's Word, in every page of the Bible, are enduring truths. Truths that, though written in prophetic form to a particular people group, there, are, there is truth that applies to every person, every culture, every time, or every generation, you might say. And what we want to do is say, Lord, what are the enduring truths that I, in obedience to Scripture and out of worship, need to apply to my life. And that's what we're going to begin to do as we look through this minor prophet. It's called a minor prophet because it's small in length, right? Um, some of the larger prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, these are long books. Uh, 55 verses in the book of Malachi, it's not a long book. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read the passage this morning. I'm going to give you an overview, and I'm going to pray, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to dive into it next week. Okay, is that okay? Yes? Okay. What'd you say? You got a roast on. Yeah, we got a roast here. So ready? Hey, listen, I hope it's that I hope it's okay that I, I we need to spend that time kind of setting up this series. Um and thinking about how to read a minor prophet like this. And I really wanted to dive into more of it today, but I really um just felt the necessity to spend this much time just getting our bearings. Uh and coming back from holidays and getting our spiritual brains back on, maybe. <laughs> so I'm going to pray. We're going to read the text, do a very quick overview, and we'll come back and look at it in more detail this week. We'll need this week to process this, too, I promise. Father in heaven, you've given us all of your word. Every word, every letter on the page in its original language is, is inspired for you. It's perfect. There's no fault in it. It's enduringly true. Our lives are but grass, but the word of God endures forever. Grass withers and the flower fades. Your word never, never fades, never fails. So, Father, I ask you for help for us as we dive into this wonderful message, but convicting message. Help us to apply it to our hearts. 
Because when we do, we'll be a people that's changed for our good and for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go. Malachi 1, 1 through 5. The oracle or word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? And yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country. I have left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, and you're going to see the word Edom, but Edom, think of Esau and the territory would be the Edomites. So when you just think Esau, Edom, speaking about the same people in the same uh, region. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down. They will be like the wicked country. I'm sorry. They will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. When you and I are tempted to doubt God's love, our confidence must come from how God has definitively demonstrated his love, which we see in what God tells us about himself in the Bible, rather than how we feel. When you doubt God's love, when I doubt God's love, it's typically because we see something happening in our life that we either don't like, we believe it's wrong, we make a moral judgment essentially that God is doing a disservice to us because something, maybe even something sinful, is happening in our life. And when that happens, what it reveals is an internal belief system that I believe God ought to operate in a certain way according to my standard of right and wrong. And when my standard of right and wrong gets slanted or gets uh, uh, abused or gets pressed in against, what begins to happen is if you would visualize an hourglass, right, my world sometimes begins to shrink. My my thinking world, my believing world begins to shrink, and all I can seem to do is focus on the ways that I have been wronged. And I very quickly, you very quickly begin to say, Lord, how could you do this to me? How could you allow this to happen to me? We just read it in Psalm 137. They're saying, Lord, let me, it's time to hang up the guitar. I can't worship you anymore. I can't sing praises to your name. Uh, we acknowledge that you somehow brought us here, but I, ca I can't worship you going through this. And like the Israelites, we begin to doubt God's love. Woe to us to be a prideful new covenant people to say, can you believe they did that? Now, we, we speak of their history kind of, you know, jovially. But it's much easier to speak of somebody else's problems jovially than to really just look at our own heart issues. So I want to ask you to identify, as we did in the beginning of the service, what is a reason? Where in your life do you find yourself doubting God's love? Because there, there are, uh, there are. This book is filled with what you might call disputations. It's a prophet, but it reads a little differently than most of the prophetic books. It reads like a lawyer laying out his case. And he brings a charge, and he gives evidence. And then he brings another charge, and he gives evidence. And then he brings another charge, and he gives more evidence. And then he sort of wraps up his case. And that's what happens here. So you've got the opening argument here in verses 1 through 5. And in the end of the book, you've got the closing argument. And in between, you've got these disputations. Dis uh, uh, disputations. You've got these charges that are being brought to the people, right? And so he's going to say, hey, you failed to worship me in the right way. You failed to tithe properly. You failed to do. And he begins to list these different things, right? Tithing is one of them. It's only one of them. And so, but he begins to list these different, these different charges, but what we see right out of the gates is that 
Malachi is the word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord stands forever. And so when we begin to doubt God's love, God's the one who comes to the Israelites here and says, children, let me tell you how I've loved you. Look at the, be- the beginning there. I have loved you, says the Lord. That have loved, that's, the, that's that perfect tense in the Bible that says, I, I have loved you. The, the have loved means that I have loved you in a way that has an enduring effect. I have treated you in a way that is not just a, a, I, I loved you with an action and then that action came off. I loved you again with a display of love, and then that display came off. It says, I have loved you enduringly. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he loved us, or he showed his love for us, in an enduring way. So that our acceptance by God is not based on how God feels at the moment. God has loved you. But you say, well, how have you loved us? Show me, God. What have you done for us lately? How have you loved me? Brothers and sisters, I want to ask you this question. When you're doubting God's love, this is why Romans 8, 5 says, but God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, how do I know God loves me? No matter what you go through in your life, the fact that God sent his only son to be the propitiation, the the, the sacrifice that satisfies all of God's wrath that should come to you, that should be enough. It is enough. But we need to recall. It's why we talk about preaching the gospel to ourselves time and time again. Well, how have you loved us? Isn't uh, Esau Jacob's brother? And in this little section of Scripture, God, through Malachi, unfolds the doctrine of unconditional election. Now, it's a doctrine that, if treated wrongly, can split churches, right? And so we're, we're going to be humble, but we're also not going to avoid God's word. If you look in Genesis 25, and really this story is 11 chapters of Genesis. It's Genesis 25 through Genesis 36. But I want you to hear the beginning of Genesis, um, uh, or part of Genesis 25 here, and, and we're going to wrap up here in a minute. These are the generations of Abram's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel and Aramean of Padaram, sister of Laban, Arimathean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now listen to this. Everybody look at me for just a minute here, okay? I know my delivery is a little different this morning, but that's okay. I want you to look what's happening on the page here. And when you find areas in the Bible that you struggle with, go back to the text and begin to wrestle with the Lord on what he's communicating to his people through his perfectly enduring word. And the children struggled together within her, in her womb. And she said, if, this, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, I've never had um, birth pangs. I've never had, uh, right, all the obvious stuff that comes with pregnancy. I'll stop talking about right now because it's going to get kind of awkward. But I've never felt, I felt babies kicking on the outside of a womb. That's about it. I can't imagine what it is for, for Mary and Elizabeth to feel John and Jesus jumping around in there. And then they walk closer together and then, bam, they get all excited. Like, hey, that's my cousin. Hey, how can you, how do you know, right? Jacob and Esau are in, in her womb. And she's like, Lord, what's going on here? And he says, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from, in, from within you shall be divided. The one, in this case the second, shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, and so they called his name Esau. And afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. And so his name was called Jacob. We read on to see that that Esau, the older, made rash decisions and he sold his birthright. But before he sold his birthright, God said, I've chosen Jacob. 
Why? What did Jacob do? Not a blessed thing. God said, I've chosen Jacob. Brothers and sisters, Jacob becomes Israel. And every we speak freely about God choosing Israel and God loving Israel and God showering his love on Israel. But before Israel was a nation, Israel was Jacob. Before Jacob was Jacob, you might say, Jacob was in utero. And God says here, and it's quoted in Romans 9, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Now, we know from Luke when, that when the Lord says, anybody who doesn't hate even is, right, father, mother, brother, sister is not worthy to be called my disciples. And we talk about that passage and we say, well, that's a term of comparison. And that's true. In that context, it's a term of comparison that means you need to love me so much more than your family. You need to be devoted to the Lord God so much more than you are to your, to your, your spouse, your, your, your mother, your father. You need to obey the Lord. But this word means, it doesn't mean hate in the sense that we know the word hate with this sinful, vitriolic vengeance. No, it means I'm against. It means I'm for Jacob and I'm against Esau. And Rebecca, what is playing out in your womb right now is two nations that are going to color all of redemption history. Pastor Matt, why would you bring this up today at the end of your sermon? Because God uses that. He takes, at the end of the Old Testament, he takes Judah, and he says, you're doubting my love? Here, Let, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back all the way to a promise I made to Abraham. And I told him I'd make a father, uh, he'd be the father of many nations, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And that was their refrain. The, fa- the, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that was their confidence-bearing refrain. He said, let's go all the way back. Don't you remember that I loved Jacob? I loved Israel. And as descendants of Israel, I love you? Is there anything more that I need to show you than when Esau's descendants, the Edomites, get destroyed in this prideful people that say, I'm going to make a name for myself? And God says, so what? Let look, at the end of, look at the end of the verse. It says, they may be rebuild it, but I'll tear it down. Right, let's go to verse 4. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts, that is the warrior name for God. Whenever you see the Lord of hosts, and it's more in Malachi than many places, the Lord of hosts, that means they want to have war with me and my plans for them. I will have war with them, and I am God, and I will win. They say, hey, we're going to rebuild. God says, they may build, but I will tear down. They They will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes, children, sons, daughters whom I love, those who are doubting my name right now, and church family, zone back in with me for this, this closing here. That what he says is, children whom I've loved, enduringly. Though you've gone though you've gone through excruciating circumstances. I have loved you. And I'm going to take you all the way back to remind you. Don't you remember that I said Jacob I loved and Esau I hated? And all the while, the Edomites say, well, we're going to rebuild. No, well, rebuild if you want. I'm just, I have a plan. I'm going to call the people to my name. So rebuild. It's destroyed again. Sometimes when we hear about the doctrine of God's unconditional election, we explain it away by saying, well, God just knew who was going to make the choice to become a Christian. Well, of course God knew that. I'm not arguing the point. But it doesn't deal with this particular 
text. Jacob I love, and Esau I'm against. Now, though that brings questions in our mind, what do we do with the questions? In closing, this morning I went out to start the car. And last night I got home and I knew I'd be leaving before anybody was really moving around this morning. And I, I park on the left side of the garage. Well, for you, that's over here. And so I typically park pretty close, just what I need to get this body out of the car, you know, and still be able to. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's for another day. Although I'm finding I can park a little bit closer to the left right now, which is pretty neat. So, uh, but, uh, so I park, anyway, so I walk out, and I walk out in the garage all the time on my sock feet. My mom got on me all days growing up. You get out, you're outside, put your shoes on, and we do it with our kids, right? So generation, generation, here we go. But I walk out in the garage in my sock feet, and I get to the car, and I step in this pile of sand, and what has happened is, in the snow, I've been driving this car around all over town and whatnot. What's happened is, my car has picked up sediment from all over the place. And then as the water melts, it is deposited right there in four piles in my garage. All right? Some of it drips. Let me, you get the idea. Brothers and sisters, as we drive around or we navigate more and more of God's word, we spend more and more time in God's word, we pick up sediments of enduring truths, realities that God has unfolded in salvation history, redemption history, and has brought in in the Holy Spirit and the memories that God has given us and the situations where God has applied that particular situation, that particular reality to our life, begin to hold true, and our sediment pile of God's word, God's enduring truth, begins to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we say, wow this wonder about who you are. That's exactly what it is. And we joke about it, but it's true. But if we avoid texts that are difficult, if we avoid realities that are difficult, we miss entire swaths of who God is. And brothers and sisters, we began with the oracle of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. You and I when we're tempted to doubt God's love, must only find our confidence in how God has demonstrated his love with enduring, fact-checking, fact-checking, fact-checked scripture that is true. And for the Old Testament, he says, look, children, 60-year-old children, Remember Jacob. Remember how I loved him. And brothers and sisters, that's part of our history. That's part of our heritage. But now we say, brother, sister, as you doubt God's love, look throughout all of the Bible, yes, but you look to Jesus. Look to Jesus on Calvary, what he did for you, how he gave his life for you. Does God need to do anything more to prove to you his love? No. So we walk by faith, not by sight, not by what we feel. And we say, Lord, I don't get it right now. And we write our own Psalm 137, and we give it to the Lord. Let's go forward in faith as God's people, leaning on his love demonstrated to us and walking with strong confidence toward the future that God has for Oak Grove Christian Church. Heavenly Father, you are altogether good. You are far and above our understanding of who you are. And so we submit that to you, but we submit to you as we learn your word, as we grow in an understanding of who you are. Broaden our perspective, not with creativity of our own strength, not by limiting what we confess about you because it makes sense to our feeble minds. In ways that we find difficult to understand, Lord, you have elected those who are in Christ to be your children. And that should cause us to worship you. And so may we worship you in spirit and in truth. May we teach our children the gift of God's grace that they would be able to hear the word of God in their church and in their homes. And may we do it all to your grace. In Jesus' name we pray.